It would be terrible to die without ever having lived. I think if you're happy inside, all the pleasures that are outside and all the, the bad things that are outside will go away. They will be held in abeyance by the way that you feel inside. And you've got to be happy and try to be happy inside. Hello and welcome to this special edition of The Bill Podcast. Tony Scannell is quite simply one of my favourite actors. He's mesmerising to watch, and in Ted Roach, he created an iconic character who was addictive viewing. I would have dearly loved to have interviewed Tony, to shake his hand and tell him just how magnificent an actor he was. I hope this tribute does the great man some justice. Over the next hour or so, you'll be hearing memories from many of Tony's co-stars from The Bill, including those who worked with him both before and after his decade on the show. We'll also hear from Tony himself, thanks to some small clips from an ITV archive interview presented here to provide quotations from a great man under fair use. No copyright infringement is intended. You've also already heard Tony speaking in a clip from another fantastic interview on YouTube. It's called On The Level, where Tony was interviewed by his close friend, Andrew Selwyn Crome, who joins us in person later in the programme to tell us about some of their adventures together, including making theatre projects, and indeed the feature film The Haunting of Harry Payne. It is thanks to Andrew and the On The Level interview, which you can hear in full on YouTube, that we can hear Tony discussing his early life. I'm from Kinsale in County Cork, the most wonderful, wonderful town in the country, or in the world, actually. I've been out of Ireland now for, well, since I was 14, and just went back to school there when I was living with my grandmother. My father was an Irish international footballer, and so consequently he was um, playing football all the time in England and um, and I was left with my grandmother. And one sister was with me in Ireland and the other sister was with my other two brothers. So we were a mi- complete mixed family. So I came from Ireland to England and I never ended up with an English accent. So I always thought that I must have got lost in the <laughs> valleys somewhere when I came. So there was Ireland, England and Wales in the middle. Growing up in Kent from the age of 15, Tony would work various jobs, including uh, as a bingo caller, TV salesman and a deck chair attendant, before he joined the RAF as a reconnaissance photographer. He became a radio DJ for the British Forces Broadcasting Service and helped out behind the scenes at the Cyprus Camps Theatre Group. It was after his five years service that he met his future The Bill co-star Larry Dan at the Cambridge Arts Theatre. Larry picks up the story now and shares his memories of Tony. I think it's true that I got, in, got him into the business in as much as I was on tour with a play at uh, the Venetian Twins. We we're on tour and we got to the Cambridge Arts Theatre. Our ASM, System Stage Manager, was having to leave us. So we were going to continue touring that in ASM until they could find one. Well, I think it must have been about five of us in that cast like to play bridge, the card game bridge. And we did spend an awful lot of time backstage playing when we went on coming back to the game, coming back to the game sort of thing. When you had to go on stage, everyone had to wait, and you came back and you picked the hand up. Dreadful. But there was this guy backstage, and he said, I'll sit in if you like. If, well, you, and it was Tony Scannell. So uh, he sat in and said, uh, throughout the week, I said off the, off the cuff, I said, look, we, um, we're minus at an ASM. Do you, if I had a word, do you want to finish the tour with us? And he said, yes. So I had a word with the uh, company manager, we had a word with our, our producer fellow, lovely Ken Pat, and my, my sort of say, said, yeah, yeah. So I said, Tony, you want to come join us? And so he did. He, so he, he came on tour with us as the ASM uh, and played bridge with us, you see. That's, that's why we wanted him. Uh, so I was then able to get him into uh, Stratford East, uh, the theatre at Stratford worked with, uh, worked with us there. So we did quite a few, few plays there as well, yeah. Lot, worked a lot, yeah. He was bloody good. We did a lot of what was known as adventure plays. It was a great writer director called Ken Hill who was who was who was there as well as Joan Little hiding in the background but Ken was running the place and he used to write plays about um, Dracula and Land of the Dinosaurs and adventure plays like that with a lot of humour a lot of songs Tony had a good singing voice very good singing voice we did a lot of those and he was terrific terrific to be on stage with in fact um, toward, just towards the end of that um, when I was there I, was, I, I, I got to direct a play there so I got him it was a musical called um, What a Crazy World. It was um, Alan Klein. It had been done, in fact, that was the first play I'd ever done at stuff, at least many years before. Tony was in that, and they, he played dad and granddad, and he was bloody great. No, he was a bloody good worker in theatre. Very good. He was lovely. Lovely, man. He was great. I, I loved him. He was 
a lot of fun. And also, we um, early days we played a lot of golf together. Tony and I, we played a lot, of, especially when we were on that tour. We, we every time we went to, we we find we find the local golf course and go out and play it. We did that a lot. <laughs> oh, we went up to um, went up to Aberdeen because they fly up to all these places. You have to Aberdeen, put you in this wonderful hotel, and it was a huge golf uh, celebrity golf thing. There's me and Tony from the bill. I don't know anyone else in the bill was on it. All the big sporting names were there. And it, it, it was great. We had this hotel, and Tony turns up, and we're all uh, around the swimming pool. Some of us are having, you know, having a swim in the swimming pool. Tony turns up. I got a feeling he was wearing evening dress, and he dives straight into the bloody pool. What the fuck are you doing, Tony? That's ridiculous. <laughs> Rather than me reading out a potted history of Tony's early achievements on stage and television, I can highly recommend Tony's Guardian obituary written with great care by the superb Toby Haydock. That gives you a great insight into his early acting career. It is, of course, the role of Ted Roach for which he is most fondly remembered and quite rightly praised. In this clip, again from Andrew Selwyn Chrome's On The Level interview, Tony himself discusses his approach to playing the Maverick Detective. I used him actually as an amalgam of, of um, about three or four detective sergeants that I had actually met during the first processes of doing the bill. A couple of sergeants, detective sergeants, um, took me out for a drink one night to, um, to meet their clientele, really, so to speak. And so I had a, a, an idea of the way that they behaved which was totally different to the way that you would expect a normal person to be. Not badly, they didn't speak about but they had a, the sergeants, they had a sort of a, a timbre about them. They was were very strong and silent, mostly silent, until you asked a question and then they would evade it as, as much as they could before they would tell you something. <laughs> but I got on very well with them and I, I basted, like my tie at the time, loosely on, um, on two or three of the police there. Responsible for the dynamic documentary-style look of the first three hour-long series of The Bill was director, later producer and executive producer Peter Krajean, who pays his tribute to Tony. I thought he brought something very, very positive to the series. We tried to cast all the policemen in it younger than had been the case before in British television because our police force was actually younger than it was being represented on the whole. Now, he always looked, I thought, slightly older than he actually was. But he had a sort of danger about him. I've always liked dangerous actors. I personally, I don't think I ever had any problems with him. I mean, he wasn't somebody who used to come and talk to me at great length about the rationalisation of his character and, uh, you know, whether his part was big enough or any of that. He just got on with it. And he always looked a bit sort of shambolic and you never quite knew what he was going to come up with next. But I think he really sort of created the character and the writers reacted to, as so often happens is the case, reacted to what he gave them so that the character and him became synonymous at times. He was an absolutely invaluable member of the cast and, you know, very good chemistry on the screen, and he and John Isles were like chalk and cheese. That's why they worked so well together. One always tried to cast, you know, everybody with a very positive separate identity, and uh, oh, he was essential and very popular with the uh, general public in the same way that Kevin was very popular. You know, they both brought a similar quality to it. I'm not sure that he was always possibly the... Uh, the genuine police's favourite policeman, but I think I'm probably there talking about the authorities rather than the police on the beat. I know the writers loved writing for him, you know, because they've got something really positive. They've got a character they could really develop and give him interesting things to do. They knew exactly what he was. But as I said, I think he created the character as much as the writers. And joining us now to share his memories of Tony is the mighty Eric Richard. I know we always try and do this, don't we? You know, never say a, a bad word about those that have passed. But in Tony's case, that is not difficult. I have no memory whatsoever in his company at work or in times relaxed. And we did spend a lot of time together offset where he wasn't just a smashing bloke to be around. He really was just a good bloke and very good at his job. If you look at 
what's being said about him in his early life, you know, being in the RAF, you know, doing a bit of this, doing a bit of that, being brought up in Ireland, coming over here. There's a man that before he ever got in front of a camera had had a bit of a life. Likewise, you know, I didn't become an actor until I was 28, 29. So, you know, I'd been places, I'd done things. And they do influence you as an actor. You, you know, you bring that to the table in a different way. Uh, than maybe other actors would do. It doesn't make your, you right and other actors wrong, but it does mean that you come with that, as Tony did, with that very particular kind of character. And, of course, what's easily identifiable by anyone who studies the business of acting, making films, making television, is that when they structured the bill, of course, there were the given characters, Galloway, Ackland, Carver, Cryer, they were the core of what the show was going to be about. And then, of course, other characters were around that. People like Jeff Stewart, of course, and Tony Scannell. And Tony delivered immediately. As soon as he hit the floor, he delivered that wonderful, nuanced character. And then if you apply that to Cryer's attitude towards him, well, Cryer's attitude would know that kind of policing that was just perhaps going towards the edge of doing things that he, Cryer, wouldn't do because he's by the book and uniform. But he, Cryer, would recognize that Roach's character needed to be that kind of man, but at heart was a good bloke and very good at his job. And in terms of our relationship, I mean, it was just a couple of mates who worked together and were very happy to go out for a pint together you know, with his girlfriend, with with my wife, you know, we'd, it was a pub we used to meet in regularly down in Dulwich, and we'd have a couple of pints together, go and have a meal together, uh, go to parties at his place, whatever. No, I mean, he was just a very good and generous bloke to be around. Tony was one of us. He was a good bloke. Another wonderful actor who worked closely with Tony on the bill is the legendary Mark Wingett. Tony was always fully committed to how he acted, and he did it with, a, with an intensity and a passion. You know, he was very passionate about acting. He was passionate about his character. And he just brought this kind of inner life to, to whatever he played, really. And he, he kind of made Roach, and I think he was one of the people that laid the foundations of the bill, because it was an extraordinary time back then, of course. The first three series of the bill were very much, um, if they weren't improvised, we very much had a very a large input ourselves into, into what was happening on screen. And Tony was absolutely fundamental in, in creating that kind of, that, that, that feeling within the cast. And, and of course, the, the end result, yeah, he was, he was committed and a very, very good actor. He was a charming man when he wanted to be, you know. <laughs> he, he was no angel. Tony was no angel. His, his like has kind of disappeared from the acting profession now, you know. Hard working, hard drinking, Irish <laughs> and proud. Had some extraordinary stories. I still remember some of his jokes that he used to say, you know, and uh, yeah, worked very closely with him for a number of years. Funnily enough, and this is one story I can tell, is uh, the only reason I passed my car test is because Tony lost his driving license and they needed another member of CID to be able to drive to do the filming shot. And that's because of that bloody Tony Scaddle. We used to have a Christmas show on the bill and Tony used to come out with this, he was this old sort of lord. He used to be out talking like that, which was, you know, <laughs> it was just further testament to sort of his sort of ability. No, he was, he was versatile and he wasn't, he wasn't used as much as he should have been. There was a very interesting um, storyline, which was a, a quite ahead of its time, for its time, which was Tony's um, relationship with Roxanne, played by um, Paul O'Grady you know, a transsexual woman, which is quite interesting. Um, that character came back, played by George Costigan, very rarely for the book, went down to Eastbourne and filmed some scenes by the seaside in, in Eastbourne with Tony, you know. But it was the same old Tony, it was the same old Tony, you know. Quite know what you were going to get from him. <laughs> he'd do something different before the take and then he'd get a go, oh, all right, okay, which is great as an actor, you know, because you can, you can react off that and feed off that. But then we, you know, we were all kind of a bit inventive in those days, let's say. You know what I mean? I mean, I was, I was really young. I was 
mid twenties, early twenties, um, when I started the film. And of course, Tony was an older actor, had more experience, and uh, used to used to knock heads on a couple of occasions over how things would be done. But I would always sort of concede to his view of things because, of course, he's he's, he's a more experienced older actor. But we would have it out. He would kind of meet you halfway. But he was certainly certainly had strong views on how a certain scene would go and how how a how a plot line should should evolve and and you know how we should play the scenes. So that that's as an actor, that's all you want really. It's it's, it's you know you want some input, you want some some something to get your juices going. And I certainly did that. That's for sure. <laughs> I mean, there was some days on the bill. You, you, you get up quite early. I'd, I'd get up at quarter past five and get to the get to the the, the studio about seven o'clock. And Tony would be there, sat with a cup of coffee in our dressing room in a tuxedo. He'd just come in from a night out. You know, I mean, he, he brought out this book. He brought out a cookery book. It was called Drunk and Disorderly. It was all about cooking with alcohol. Like all these recipes that Tony had made. You know. So he certainly used his kind of celebrity to do other stuff. You know? I remember once that we sat in the old flask and um, doing this scene, which Burnside was going to join us later in the scene. And we sat there and they, they had real pints of beer and we chasers. And mine was a Jack Daniels and pints of lager. And we were sinking this during the scene. I must have, I don't know, half a dozen pints. And I said, could I have another Jack Daniels, please? Someone said, Mark, you've drunk the bottle between you. Anyway, we, we, we played the scene. I think it's very good, actually. Two coppers getting drunk. And then Chris Ellison turned up. We took, turned up on set. Oh, fucking hell, look at the state of you two. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, Tony. Oh, Tony. He loved it. He's lo- he loved his celebrity and he loved life. You know. That was Tony. Following up on Mark's observations about Tony's celebrity, here's a great man himself talking in 2000 when promoting his return to the bill, where I feel he was giving himself a bit of a hard time on reflection. When I think of the, the executive producers that I've worked with and that worked with me, and they sort of put up with really stupid things that I would do and they would try to help me. You'd have about three or four days off, you know, and I'd spend three or four days going to nightclubs, not taking myself seriously enough as an actor. You'd get three or four invitations to go anywhere you wanted to go for any one particular week or even in a, in a day you'd have three or four and a car would be sent to you. And I don't mean just a car, I mean a car. And everybody is looking, who's in that? And after a while, I don't care how good you are, you begin to believe your own press. I don't know, I suppose it's a basic feeling of of, of wanting to be liked as well. Well, now joining the long list of legends who did like Tony and were happy to share their memories of him is another cast member of The Bill's early years, a regular for the first five years of a show. We hear now from the wonderful Ashley Gunstock. He was a fabulous actor, one of our Bill cabaret nights. Um, He did a, a, a monologue, a very, very hysterical monologue about a butler and drinking and one thing and another. And it was just fabulous to watch. The technique of the man, it was really top notch. I mean, he really knew his stuff. You're going to hear it probably over and over if you haven't already, but he, he was a lovable rogue. He, he was very good to me, actually, because early on when I wasn't getting, you know, big parts in, in the episodes, he saw one episode that I was in where I had a little bit to do. And afterwards, he, he, he was saying to everybody, the moment, the moment for me was, I was the home beat officer and I went in to, to speak to some people. The super had taken us there. And we sat in the car afterwards and he went to turn the engine over and it wouldn't start. And I was looking over and I said to him, the fuel gauge showing empty, sir. And it was that, and he picked that moment out, the whole episode. He said, the moment for me was that. It seemed so real. And I thought, well, coming from him, that was something. And then, he, you know, we'd, we'd talk to each other and he'd give, us, give me some advice. And, you know, to get that from uh, uh, an older actor is invaluable, you know, to someone like me. I, I used to like, like to make light of things. And I always used to have a joke or two. And he loved hearing the jokes. So we'd spend, you know, the, the, the rehearsal periods, you know, when we weren't going over our lines or, you know, we had some free time telling each other gags. And um, he, he, just, he just loved that. And, and so, if anything, I was honing my timing with him 
Because if I could make him laugh, then I knew I was getting somewhere. You know? I mean, you know, he had his wild side as well, as I'm sure you can imagine. And, uh, you know, you didn't put Tony in and take him out of a cab. You poured him in and poured him out of it. I mean, it, it was just like, he did like, you know, he was, he was a, a, an Irishman with a lust for life. And he went for it as, as a lot of uh, life-loving Irishmen do. And uh, we had some great nights out, you know. He was quite a character. Everybody had a, an eye for him because he, he, he had a twinkle in his. He was always looking for, <laughs> for the devilish moment, you know. He did like to find, you know, a deviation of, of some sort or whatever. And it, and it showed in his acting. There was that, there was that energy, there was that spark that made that character work. And one of the things he, he said is that what he, he used to do, and it was a technique, he used to make his eyes wide. So you, you, you thought, whoa, hold on, what's, what, what's going on behind those kind of thing? And so there was this wild, wild looking element. I mean, it was, it was controlled to his work and he, and he liked to do things off the cuff as well. So it's a, a sadder place for a loss of someone like that. Arguably, the actor Tony shared the most screen time with in his early years on the bill was the legendary John Isles, who shared some fantastic memories of his friendship with Tony. We became very good friends. We weren't just on set friends. He moved down to my neck of the woods in Charlton when I was in Greenwich. It's two minutes down the road. And he liked, because he used to come to my house a lot, and he loved the area. And he said, I'm going to buy a house. Here. And I said, well, go over to Charlton, you'll get more house for your money. And he got a beautiful, like mine, a three-bedroomed, terraced, Victorian house. And so we socialised a lot. I mean, I thought I could socialise, but Tony, he won medals for it. A charming blow. The more he parted, and we, we, uh, I introduced him to my other acting friends outside of the bill, and, and he introduced me to friends of his... The bigger and rowdier the party might have got, the more charming Tony became. He, he was just, there was no side to him at all. He just got more ebullient and bigger and more charming as evenings went on. And the other thing I remembered was something I had no idea about. I'd go, I went round to his house when he moved in. Virtually a shell, the house was, and he was camping in it. It was one of those, you know, one plug and, you know, boiling a kettle for hot water to wash. And in the space of a, a, only a few months, I went there. There was a brand new kitchen decorated throughout. And I said, God, this must have cost you a fortune on top of the purchase price and all that. And he did it all himself. I had no idea. Incredibly skilled. Fitted the whole kitchen on his own. Building shelves, wall units, television units. Everything. He did the lot himself, rewiring. He was just an extraordinary guy. And a totally unique actor. His acting style, it was a one-off. You only had to hear a couple of words, and you would know if you were a fan of the show, you'd go, that's Tony Scannell. Unmistakable, that beautiful, soft Irish lilt. And that laugh. We laughed at that. It went on when, when Chris Ellison joined. And we moved into the Burnside era from the sepia period of Galloway. Honestly, it was a very smaller, much smaller group, 15 regulars, I think, but such a close-knit band. And it was such fun. John Salthouse, uh, he wouldn't mind me saying so, it can be quite an edgy chap. He doesn't suffer fools gladly. He's a perfectionist. And he had a reputation. He came with a reputation which was dispelled so quickly. That band of us in CID, we got on so well. We just laughed and laughed and laughed. And that band expanded into that close group of those 15 early regulars. And Tony was very much at the, in, the, in the heart of that. He was always the life and soul and always took part. And he was great. He was great. Bloody awful at learning his lines. He always got a 
but he'd learn it, something I could never do. He'd learn on the hoof during rehearsal. He was far too busy when he got home, you know. <laughs> he didn't have time to sit down and study the script. It, ridiculous. They'd learn it on the set. <laughs> Socially, we were completely different. He's a hard drinking, hard living guy. I was the complete opposite, a rather fey Oscar Wilde to his Richard Burton. <laughs> and yet that there was a lovely bond, a lovely bond. We enjoyed each other's company a lot. He had an interest in everything. If somebody came up and started chatting to us, within seconds he'd find out what job they did, where they did it, how long they'd been doing it. And he'd be knowledgeable about most jobs that you could ever mention. He'd engage with members of the public who came out and said, oh, can you sign this? Or, you know, just want to say I liked you. He, he wouldn't just go, you know, duh, 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 like most of us would, to be honest. He engaged with people and he had a thirst for finding out about people. He wanted to know what made people tick. He would ask you questions. He wanted to know about your past about what, what excited you, what upset you. you. You'd run the whole gamut. He was great. There's that unpredictability about him as well. On, on set as well, you know, which was lovely actually, that he, he, he'd think of things to do and, and all. But in life as well, you were never quite sure on what he was gonna do next. I'm sure other people will say a one-off as well, but he was a one-off, just a lovely original, like a favorite painting. Every time you saw him, you smiled. He just made you smile. He had this glint in his eye all the time. He was my favourite painting for a long time. <laughs> By the end of the third series of hour-long episodes, The Bill was regularly enjoying over 15 million viewers, and so ITV turned the series into a twice-weekly half-hour format. Joining the cast in 1988 for the start of Series 4 was the wonderful Barbara Thorne. Well, there's so many parts of Tony Scannell, but he was very real, very unexpected. He was polite. He was very, very curious about stuff. Funny. He, I think he was always true to himself. I don't think he put anything on at all. And quite often when we were all being called out of the makeup room to go on set, Tony Scannell is coming in with his dicky bow tie, hasn't been to bed at all. <laughs> Does, you know. And of course, at the time, I mean, I was just oh, horrified that he was doing that. But he just carried it off, carried it off. And then quite often... As a group, we were asked to go to, I think we were down at Roger Leach's part of the woods and there was a big car rally thing. And we always used to gather anyway at weekends and Tony happened to come to this one. He stood with me quite a lot of the time. He really was being the gentleman. There were so many, so many things about Tony Scannell and I'm sure that we've all got interaction with what Tony did with Mark Wingett, what Tony did with John. You couldn't put him in a box and say, this is what Tony Scannell is, because there's so many bits to him. And he didn't shield them off. He was just always very open. Despite whatever they'd written in the scenes, he would find a way that is truthful for him. That's what I would think about with Tony. He was his own man. Another Sun Hill legend who joined the CID ranks during this Balby Road era was Andrew McIntosh. One memory I've got of t Tony is my one and only trip to Stringfellows, which was not somewhere that I would naturally frequent. And I have no idea how I ended up there. But Tony clearly um, went there frequently and knew Peter Stringfellow fairly well. Towards the end of the evening, or probably because I'm such a lightweight, probably midway through the evening, I said, I've got to go, and staggered towards the exit. And they said, so oh, good, sir, I'd like a taxi. And I went, yeah. And uh, they poured me into this white Jaguar XJ6. I remember the car very well, which then whizzed me back to my home in southeast London. Uh, and they wouldn't take any money. And then I uh, discovered subsequently that Tony had paid for it. He was extremely generous. And I remember another time 
much later on when uh, because he lived in South East London as well at the time and I got together with my my then wife and a chap called Jonathan Whaley who I was at drama school with and Jonathan's ex-girlfriend who was now going out with Tony which was an interesting dynamic worked perfectly well uh, and we had a really nice time a really nice time it was like a summer evening sitting in a pub outside a pub somewhere and um that's, that's the only two times I really socialized with Tony. Both extremely enjoyable. Both, again, exhibiting his generosity. And he was really good company. And he was funny as well, actually. He was naughty. He was naughty. <laughs> he would like to muck around quite a lot. But not in, a, in any way, um, a nasty way. or a, There wasn't any mal- malice in Tony at all. I don't think ever. But he was a, he was a naughty boy. The bill kept going from strength to strength, and in 1990, the cast would move to their new permanent home in Merton. New cast members would join the ranks to help with the ever-increasing demands on the regular cast, who are now making over 100 episodes a year. Joining in 1991 as Sunhill's new collator was the fantastic Louise Harrison. Tony was a great character in the bill. In fact, he often tops lists of the most memorable characters. With his striking Irish looks, big blue eyes surrounded by lots of dark eyelashes and a moustache and cheeky smile, he played a kind of maverick type policeman. Tony, in my mind, had the sort of on-screen bad boy charisma that one would often see in the likes of Albert Finney, Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole. He was so watchable on the screen that you almost didn't notice the other actors. I was always very aware of him in the room, along with Chris Ellison, who was his pal off screen. Such was the charisma. People usually say that about the likes of Elvis, JFK, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, to be able to feel someone's presence in the room when you're not even looking at them. Tony was always utterly charming to me and affectionate and friendly. He was a generous actor to work with too, especially for the young ones, and great fun. Some years later, in the noughties, I saw him at a theatre and he gave me a warm bear hug like he'd just seen me last week. I think Tony's family should feel very proud of his legacy and contribution to British television and for making this part his own, but also for the many character parts he played in other roles. I saw his showreel. He's really very versatile. He really reminds me of those bad boys of the 60s, those kitchen sink dramas. I kind of think that had he been born a decade earlier, he would have had their kind of career, in a sense, because he had that sort of quality, that sort of screen presence. He's just really charismatic. He's got a great face. I'm so sad. I'm sad that he he has died because it's not old. 74 is not old these days. But uh, I get the impression he had a full life. He lived life to the full. I think he really grabbed everything he could out of life. Very nice man. Very affectionate. Nice to work with. Good ensemble cast member. You know, very, very nice man. Another exceptional actress who joined the series in 1993 was the phenomenal Kerry Pears. But before joining as DC Susie Croft, Kerry played a rape victim in two episodes in 1990, where Tony gave, in my opinion, one of his greatest performances. Making her debut on the Bill podcast, Kerry kindly joined us to share her memories of working with Tony on one of her first television roles. Tony wasn't a friend because he was leaving when I joined. So I really only did these visiting episodes with him. So we filmed the first episode. Of course, we had lovely Chris Hudson, was just the most wonderful director, really thoughtful and caring and attentive. And he, he really cared about what he was doing and the actors. And Tony was just totally there for me. He was completely supportive. It was not that long for me after leaving drama school. So I think I probably came to this role, bringing a bit of method with me. And and, uh, I I was very, very, very serious about it. It was really so important to me to do it right. And he completely supported me on that. He was very intense about the whole situation, about the whole performance situation. Even when, because I really didn't want to speak when we were filming the first episode. I, didn't, I really didn't want to talk to anyone. I just wanted to stay in the zone. I couldn't have wished to have been with a finer actor because he was completely in the zone with me. That's how it felt to me. He was totally, totally on it, on the lines, on the scenes that uh, were coming, you know, what was coming before, what was coming after compared to what we were filming right now. The story he knew. I think he really loved that script, Tony. 
I think he really loved that script and I think he really loved what his character was doing in that particular episode because he seemed to me, he seemed to really, really care that we got it right. And as I say, he was very protective of me as well. So I can't remember whether it was a makeup artist or a runner who came up and wanted to do something or ask me something and was engaging me in conversation. And Tony said, can we just have a minute, please? <laughs> and he's just like, he totally respected what, where I was coming from, you know, that I was a young actor and I wanted to stay in this, in my character and... Uh, he totally got that. I, I think he really cared about it. And I think he was really delighted when it went to the second episode. So Chris Hodson overshot by, I think, 20 minutes but of all usable material. And Pat Sands, the producer, really loved it. And so they decided to add an extra storyline and turn it into two episodes. And when I went back, Tony was like, huge, hugely welcoming and... Yeah, I just remember him as being wonderful. I couldn't have wanted anyone else but Tony to do it. And I'm not saying that now because he's passed on. I've always said that. I wouldn't have wanted to have done that episode with anyone else. I thought he was so intense and serious and caring. I thought he hit those nuances. When he asked me what my name was, I think I eventually replied Jennifer. And he's, I think his line was something like, well, my name's Edward, but calling me that is an arrestable offence. <laughs> really smashed it and I remember I've not seen that episode since broadcast and I still remember that I, I remember it at the time just thinking like oh you, you just you so nailed that <laughs> he was a very fine actor I was very very sad when I, I saw that he'd passed I really was because he was he was important to me I just loved hearing Kerry's memories of how supportive Tony was to her and she joined as a regular just as Tony was leaving after nine years on the series. And in this clip from 2000, when promoting his return to the show, Tony recalls that fateful encounter with Inspector Munro in Punch Drunk and talks about the challenges of becoming a jobbing actor again after leaving the series. Had I apologised to him, it wouldn't have gone upstairs. The idea was that if I apologised uh, about hitting him, I, it was all set up for me to go and meet him and then I go down and it was wonderfully filmed. And I, I went down and he said... Ted, I understand you have something to say to me with that sort of smug look that Colin can give. So I looked at him and said, nah. When I went back this time to the bill and seeing the people that I'd worked with about 10 years ago, and I don't just mean the actors, I mean the actual, the crews, cameramen and that, that, that I used to get on with. And I thought, you know, I was on the bill for nine years and I never actually tried to figure out about what was actually working the camera or working the sound. They used to know me and I used to know them, but I never, I never talked to them at all. Or, but I only realised that afterwards. You, you, just don't, you just take things for granted when people give you things free. So I suppose really in that way I didn't understand what, what success was about. I mean, I'm back acting on television and people with television or with films, people can see what you can do immediately. I really do love stage more than I do television because the, 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 the hype that's, that's there before going on and the people you're working with in that moment. But you need, you need money to live to any sort of standards, getting more and more money all the time. And I, I was doing catch up, I think, for many years. This is the year, this is my year. And then something again wouldn't happen or I get a good job. And then you think, well, something will lead from that. But an actor's life, as such, you know, you work for three months, you get good money for three months, but then you've got to make another nine months work out of that. Well, after this interview in 2000, Tony did continue to enjoy work on television. He was extremely funny playing a parody version of himself in Charlie Brooker's series, Unovations, where he was the celebrity guest salesman on a shopping channel. Yes, it is me, but I'm not actually in your house. I'm on the telly. I know what you're thinking, as bloody usual. This time, I'm speaking to you because you, whatever your name is, whoever you are, you are genuinely important to me. And here's why. I want you to buy something from me. You knew that was coming, didn't you? The hard sell? Of course you did. You're no fool. You've been around. That's why I like you. You've played the odds. You know the score. I'm not going to screw you around here with any of that false flattery stuff. You're too smart for that. All I'll say is this. I have a washing up bowl full of rusty old spoons and I have to sell them all. 
and I want you to buy them. Join me tonight and prove yourself. Tony would also continue to receive critical acclaim on stage, and in 2005, he was reunited with his friend and fellow The Bill legend, Chris Ellison, for a national tour of the murder mystery, The Gentle Hook. Chris joins us now to share his memories of his long friendship with Tony. So I've known Tony, I knew him nearly 40 years ago. Uh, in fact, it was 40 years ago. When I first met Tony, because he lived in a flat of a girl, he wasn't his girlfriend, but it was a friend, and she shared a dressing room with my wife when I first met Anita. And they were both in My Fair Lady. I used to go to the pub in Maiden Lane to have a drink before they, she came out of the theatre to pick her up. And Tony was often there. And Tony and I became quite good friends just by having a drink in the pub. And long before we worked together... And little did I know that a few years later, it would be five years later, I would be working with him on the bill. That was before I was Frank Burnside. That was when I was Tommy Burnside. He was a very good actor. He was an excellent actor. It's a terrible shame because I, I haven't seen Tony for years. I did speak to him on the phone a couple of times, but I've never seen him. He moved up to Norfolk. I, I toured with him about 2004. So we did a play together. That was fun. We toured around the country, and of course, I've we renewed a friendship. I remember Tony was a fun. He was a fun. We used to have some laughs. I tell you, he was a he was a larger than life. Tony, he he remember one story. It was on that theatre tour, and we were playing Guildford, the Yvonne Arno Theatre. And Tony said to me, because I, I was commuting it from Brighton, it was easy for me. But I, he was staying there. He said to me on the first day we were there he said I've got these really nice digs he said I'm staying with this woman she's she's out it was the days of when the, the tanning tents had just come out and she said she said he's she's persuaded me to to be one of her to try out her tan thing and um, I said well be careful <laughs> anyway the next day I saw him and he, I said Tony what's happened and he looked like a gypsy pony <laughs> he, he got b the bits of tan on one part. No, not and it hadn't worked out very well. And he said, "How oh, am I going to go on stage like this?" I said, "I said, well, just just keep that side to the audience." <laughs> oh God, oh poor, poor bugger! He was he was he was um. It didn't work out very well. The tanning. He had a lot of laugh, and he was a bit of a hellraiser. We all know that. I mean, obviously not in his last years, but when I knew him, he was. It's difficult to say this. I don't want to upset Agnes, because I'm sure she knows, because she was before, long before he was with her. But they used to be calling him Tony Scandal. <laughs> <laughs> that was Nulu who came up with that. I just remember they said Tony Scandal. That's very clever. But he was just, he was larger than life. He was, he was good company. I always used to make me laugh with Tony because a lot of people used to think he was Welsh, you know, because they always say, that Welsh guy. And they and I say, he's not Welsh, he's Irish because he came from Cork and they've got a very different accent from Cork. He had that, that Cork accent, which was completely it's a different Irish accent. In actual fact, I always thought Tony was not, he was a bit of a loner, I always felt. He was not, he didn't go out of his way to socialise with anybody particularly on the show. I think he was quite close with John Isles. Good man. You know, I'm in touch with Billy Murray and Mark and uh, John Isles. But I, Tony, I don't think, I don't know anybody who's been in touch with him. And I didn't even know Agnes. I'd never met her. I knew her name, but I didn't know her at all. I was so out of touch with him, I hadn't seen him for so long. And then to suddenly find out that he'd passed, it was... I feel so sad about it. He was a great character, Tony. I just feel rather bad about it, the fact that having talking about him now, I just fell out of touch with him and I never saw him. I reminded Chris of another project that he and Tony worked on together in 2005. They reunited one final time, paying homage to Frank and Ted in a sketch for the ill-fated and poorly received Reeves and Mortimer sketch series, Monkey Trousers. Monkey Trousers, the biggest low... This is that was funny because I know that Tony and I were sitting in the dressing room when we got there. I remember turning to him and he's looked at me and we looked at each other 
and one of us said, and I think it was me actually, I said, well, this is about as funny as AIDS, isn't it? It's fucking shit. And it was. It was crap. Yeah, I can't remember what we were supposed to be doing, some observation on some house. I do remember that. I'd forgotten all about that. Well, that must have been the last time I worked with, the, saw him because we'd done the play before that, I think. It was called The Gentle Hook, the play. I said, it's 15 years since I've seen him. So I'd forgotten the fact that monkey trousers business. That was, what a load of put that was. Oh, God, blimey. I remember we were sat in the dressing room and then he said, oh, you know, just shy. And then we suddenly heard these voices through the wall chatting and it was them, Rings and Mortimer. <laughs> And I thought, well, I don't think we'll be doing another episode of this. <laughs> we did have such good times. I mean, I think he'd ask anybody who was at the, in the bill at that time. It, it, they'd probably say it was probably the happiest working times they'll ever have had. There was nothing like it. I've I'd done loads of guests, the villains and stuff in the other shows through those decades. There was no atmosphere on any of the others like there was on the bill. It was completely, it was a real, it was a real brotherhood or sisterhood. There was a real feeling of community on that show, which you didn't get on any other show. I'd done them all. There was never, never a feeling like there was on the bill. I watched part of the um, obituary to Tony. There was quite a lot of stuff on Facebook, obviously. And suddenly somebody put up his last episode, Punch Drunk. That was great. Very, his last episode. And my God, we had some good scenes in that as well. Yeah, mind the suit. And I'm trying to help him. And then he went and punched poor old Colin Tarrant. He's done some really good work, Tony, and because uh, he also directed a lot of stuff. Uh, but he, he's a director as well, which he directed a lot of plays. Tony was heavily involved in directing and supporting theatres in Suffolk, where he enjoyed the last 25 years of his life. He directed a number of plays produced by his good friend, Andrew Selwyn Crome who joins us now to share his memories of a 25-year friendship with Tony. It was kind of love at first sight, really. I'm very lucky because Tony knew absolutely everybody. I mean, he was very well-liked and, and he, he'd had this sort of persona built round him by his kind of publicity agent as being this sort of hard-drinking, rebel-rousing Irishman, you know. And I suppose in the 80s, it it kind of suited the, the public persona, you know, the kind of bad boy, you know, kind of high living, you know. You know, the truth behind it was, is yes, I mean, he, he, he'd had an amazing time and he, he, he liked to be able to, to enjoy himself. He knew how to do that. But underneath it beat the heart of a lion and uh, a man of immense wisdom and great intelligence but also really very shy he was never one to push himself forward even though i think that that he was probably one of the best actors the country had so although as i say he knew lots of people and he was very erudite and uh, well educated and and knew a lot he he never really kind of pushed friendships you know what i mean he was never one to, to kind of force himself on people you know it was he was tony but our relationship for some reason was a bit different we our families grew up together in the end because um you know agnes had uh, sophie and my wife had my daughter jemima at the same time we virtually lived in each other's houses we were always having dinner parties. We would always go on holiday together. We even nearly bought a house together to share. So it, it was very close. And he announced that he was going to do Oliver and set up a theatre company. I went, OK, that's good. He goes, um, would you like a, a, a little part in it? And I said, well, you know, Tony, you know, I'm not really an actor. I mean, I'll help out. He said, my boy, you act every day. I said, OK, well, give me something little. He said, just a small part. So by the end of the show, I ended up playing five different roles, uh, eight costume changes. And from then, we kind of snowballed. So I ended up producing, acting, directing, 
producing with Tony, you know, sharing projects. You know, I set up about three different theatre companies and he was always part of what I was doing, you know. And mainly because I had such admiration for him as an actor, you know. I was frustrated because for me, one of the main reasons why I did the feature film was to show what the world was missing from the point of view of, of Tony Scanlon as an actor. And the performance he gave in The Haunting of Harry Payne it was immensely powerful. I mean, there were some very good scenes in there. It was mesmerising to watch, you know. We'll be hearing more about Andrew's friendship with Tony, but whilst on the subject of The Haunting of Harry Payne, Tony was joined by another Sunhill legend in this feature film. Pursuing Harry was a wise detective inspector, played none other than the one and only Mr Graham Cole OBE. I actually thought that Ted Roach was a, was a great character. I think he encapsulated CID really, really, in those days, really, really well. And Tony brought a lot to that. And a lot of people thought it was Welsh for some godforsaken reason that I never quite understood because it was the most beautiful road, wasn't it? And, uh, and his delivery too. In the Bulby Road days, I can remember him coming in to work in a full DJ, having been out... <laughs> all night and I how the hell is he doing that because I was having enough difficulty just hanging on <laughs> on the general 12 hour day shifts that we were doing at the time but he was a larger than life character he was actually sort of bigger than Roach or anybody he ever played I think uh, to be honest and and I don't know if the other actors have said but he was quite a quiet man he never really shared so I didn't know really about his marriages and things until we did what I call the haunting of Harry Payne, which is Evil Never Dies, where in actual fact was, wow, I don't know how many years, 20 years later? I don't know how many years in Thetford, all that areas in Thetford and all those strange woods and, and buildings. And it was quite lovely because he lived quite close. I think he was lower stock or somewhere near there. So he stayed at home, whereas I was in, in digs and things there. But we had some really interesting chats. And I actually got to know him better because, as you know, you know, the bill, we never really had time. Sort of sit and gossip very much, and unless something gone horribly wrong with the schedule. Uh, making a movie, because you just have time, you have time to discuss the character and you have time to discuss each of the scenes. And what was fortunate for me was that, of course, knowing Tony as I did, reading the script, it's made it's tailor made for him, for that sort of eccentricity. A real character, a man's man, someone who, if he had your back, he would have your back forever that he's that he was that kind of character but i think probably more so than anything he was a really really good actor he could have carried a series on his own i think he was that kind of uh, of character and uh, and seriously sadly miss we need those characters in and around us we really do I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone listening to this when I say how grateful I am to his good friend Andrew Selwyn Crome for sharing some of his treasured memories of his adventures with Tony, which continue now. When I was with him, and bear in mind we were living in Suffolk, I mean, if I had a penny for all the people who would come up and just say, you're Ted Roach, aren't you? You know, yes, that's right, Ted Roach from the bill. Yes. He would always be stopped and, and, you know, people would be very nice and polite and he'd always sign out for autographs and he liked the general public and, and he liked to entertain. I remember in Ireland there was a little old lady and it was raining, you know, and this little figure came along the road and the umbrella sort of tipped up and this little Irish lady looked up at Tony. We'd stopped dead in the street, you know, in the rain. And she said, now, don't you be telling me you're not who you are. And Tony said, yes, I am who I am. And so there'd be all these different people you'd meet on the way. And he really was just so naturally, hysterically funny. I mean, the things that he would do, everything from being on set and chasing a moth, running around the woods to, to make sure it didn't get harmed, you know, to being someone who would lift your spirits. He, he did this special for the Caravan Club. One, one of the conditions he had was that he, he got a free holiday and he got to use one of their motorhomes. 
but he said he has to take his friend with him, you see. So he announces that he'd organised these two motorhomes for us to go on this sort of tour, starting in the New Forest and going all the way. I wish I'd, I'd videoed it. I should have done a video blog, but it was a while ago. And he burnt through three clutches on this motorhome, <laughs> revving this cute monster up this hill, you know, and then took a porch out <laughs> of his mother's house for <laughs> parking it. Realizing he was so tall, you know. The strangest adventures, it was everything from rescuing him when he'd driven into a, a large <laughs> puddle which thawed and had flooded his engine and the car had broken down. And I had to turn up at three o'clock in the morning. He carried Agnes like a queen, you know, like Walter Riley laying the cloak down, except the cloak was, was going to be swamped by this, this massive sort of flood. Because he was obviously quite a hero in Ireland as well, he was asked to go and open Planet Hollywood in Dublin. I went with him. We got on the plane, and I think I started with a, a glass of red wine. That was at some ungodly hour. And then and then we got there, and uh, everything was free. You know, the, the, the alcohol was free, the food was free. I was enjoying myself in, in bibing. And um, I lost Tony for a little while. He sort of disappeared. I went back to the uh, to the hotel. I got back about, I don't know, three or four o'clock in the morning. And we had a flight to catch the next day. And Tony hadn't appeared, you know. I was getting a bit worried. And then about seven in the morning, the door opens. And in walks a concierge with Tony looking wide-eyed. And he just turned around to me and he said, Boy... Have I seen Dublin? I don't know where he disappeared to. <laughs> Tony was always the life and soul of the party. I mean, he he managed to light up a room, no matter where he was, and regale you with stories and, and anecdotes. And he was always the type of man who people, especially women, would would kind of gravitate towards you know so he was yeah he totally was a very attractive guy you know in his time he's um he had quite a, a magnetic personality a good looks you know and he was very humble though actually you know he never took advantage of of his his natural gifts they were just tony i was lucky enough to know the real tony the, the man behind the persona and Tony loved life. He he loved sunbathing. He loved the sun. He loved sitting out in the garden with a can of Stella, you know, and we'd sit there with our sun hats on and put the world to rights. And we, we'd talk about everything from philosophy to relationships to acting projects. Just very conversational, very relaxed, very happy. We were always very happy in each other's company. And it was in that happy company that Andrew conducted the most in-depth interview with Tony that exists on the internet. His on-the-level interview for Lewis Masonic's YouTube channel sees Tony reflecting on his life. I'd reached an age, really. I'd reached 60. And I thought, like the song, you know, I thought, well, is that all there is, my friends? Then let's keep dancing. But, And I had been questioning lots of things over the between sort of 45 and 60 what's wrong with my life there were parts of it just just needed to be sorted out you know i thought it would be terrible to die without ever having lived i think if you're happy inside all the pleasures that are outside and all the the bad things that are outside will go away they will be held in abeyance by the way that you feel inside. And you've got to be happy and try to be happy inside. The interview for On The Level, it was interesting for me because he was very candid and very open. You know, Freemasonry is described as a peculiar system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. And people often think that it's a secret society. It isn't, actually. It's a society with secrets, and the secrets are only relevant to when you're in a lodge. It's much misconstrued and misunderstood and vilified, and it has always been a fondest wish of Tony's to be a Freemason. 
Because actually, Freemasonry is almost a, a system of moral plays, and it's about taking a, a, a good man and making him better. It, it is a spiritual awakening, you know. Tony was was actually underneath it all a very spiritual man. I mean, he he did have faith, and he did get involved very much with Buddhism as well, which is a very very spiritual discipline. You have to learn how to to live in the now and not always live in the past. And Tony was always one for being very capable of living in the now. He rolled with the punches. He never found that knockbacks got him down because there was always something to do. We miss his presence and we miss his, his ability to make you laugh under any circumstance. Somebody that you could love warts and all. Do you know, the best way to sum it up was that one of the best pieces of advice that Tony gave me, which I still use to this day and have used for my son, who's an actor as well. I dried on stage and it's the worst scenario. It's the worst nightmare. I just wished the world would open up and swallow me. It was horrible. And I vowed never to be an actor again after that. I couldn't. It was such a horrible experience. But Tony, I told him about this and... Uh, he said, oh, it happens, it happens, my boy. He says, you know, look, the beginning of it. He said, look, at the end of the day, they can't hang you for it. <laughs> and I suddenly went, all right. He said, because you forget, he said, people come to see the play and they don't bloody know what it's about because they've never seen it. So you could say anything and you'd get away with it. And I became a master ad-libber. Thanks to Tony, and I never worried again. It's seen me through an amazing amount of, of times, that, that one, one phrase, you know, they can't hang for it. My huge thanks to Andrew for sharing such personal memories of his 25-year friendship with Tony, especially at such a raw time in his grieving. Indeed, I am so grateful to all the contributors who have shared their memories of Tony, either on audio in this programme or via email. Tony was a man I would have loved to have met, but thanks to the kindness and generosity of his colleagues, friends and family, I feel I have got to know him and I hope you feel the same too. I am sending so much love to Agnes, Tom, Sophie and all of Tony's family and friends. I've been thinking of you all throughout the process of making this programme, uh, which has been an honour to celebrate one of my favourite actors. Let's finish with a laugh. And who better to deliver it than the man himself in another of his very funny celebrity intros from Unovations. No copyright infringement is intended. You can find these and enjoy them on YouTube. There is some gold dust in there. Here he is, the one and only Mr. Tony Scannell. You might recognise me from the TV or if you were at the UK judo finals in 98, you might have seen me give a prize to a seventh Dan from Cardiff. I was born a normal person, but now I'm a famous one. You've probably seen me opening a village fete or even written to me asking if I could rouse a friend from a coma. And if you did, I hope I obliged.